just wait for the last people to join. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the RSA. Um, my name is Rowan Conway. I am Director of Development here, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's special lunchtime chat, conversation and presentation from Tim Harford. Before we begin, can you please make your mobile phones onto silent? Um, but we do want you to join in on the debate, and I think our hashtag today for Twitter is RSA Messy. Um, so please do get involved in the discussion. Um, now that the housekeeping notices are over, it is my very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tim Harford. You will know Tim Harford as the senior columnist, potentially at the Financial Times, or um, as the commentator, you'll find his voice very familiar from Radio 4's More or Less, which he presents his from which he presents his book, The Undercover Economist, sold millions of copies, and he was Economics Commentator of the Year in 2014. Today he's here to talk about something quite different, quite different for an economist um, and someone who is usually in the um, arena of mathematics and statistics. He's here to talk to me today about mess and creativity, which is, in his, in his view, how to be creative and resilient in a tidy-minded world requires mess. So I'm really excited to hear about this. My mother is in the audience and will be um, learning from why messy was very important in my development. Um, and we are really excited to find out more about how to be creative in this tidy world. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tim Harford. Thank you very much. There are, I think, about 150 people in this room. So just imagine what it would feel like to step out onto the stage in front of 10 times as many people. That was the challenge that faced Keith Jarrett back in 1975. He was going to improvise a concert of solo piano music at the Cologne Opera House. 1,400 people, packed house. No sheet music, no rehearsal, just one man and one piano. But a few hours before that concert, a young German teenager called Vera Brandis, just 17 years old, stepped with Jarrett out onto the stage of the empty opera house, looked out over the empty seats, the, the dim green glow of the emergency exit signs, providing the only illumination in the room. And she was thrilled because it was Vera's idea to get Keith to come to Cologne. She was fueled only by her enthusiasm for jazz. She just loved jazz, she wanted more jazz in Germany, and despite the fact she didn't really know what she was doing, she began to set up these concerts. And the Jarrett concert, huge concert, was just the fourth one that Vera had organized. And there was a problem. So Vera introduced Keith to the piano, you know, his, his instrument for the evening. And Jarrett looked at the piano, somewhat suspiciously, played a couple of notes, walked around it, went to talk to his producer. His producer came over, played a couple of notes, muttered conversation. Vera, by this time, of course, is feeling really concerned. And then Keith Jarrett's producer, Manfred Eicher, comes over to Vera and says, if you don't get a new piano, Keith won't play. Now, this wasn't some kind of fussy, prima donna-ish behavior from Keith Jarrett. There was a real problem with this instrument. What had happened was the, uh, the movers from the Cologne Opera House, the clue's in the name, opera, right? They're not into jazz. The, the movers from the Opera House had found a piano, it turned out to be the wrong one, moved it onto the stage, and it's half past three on a Friday afternoon, everyone knocks off for the weekend, that's it. There's no, there's no way of replacing this thing. So what did they leave Keith Jarrett? They left him a beaten up old rehearsal model. So the white keys were, were sticking, the, the black keys were out of tune, the pedals didn't work, the upper register of the piano was harsh and tinny because the felt had worn away. And the most important thing is that it wasn't a grand piano. It wasn't, a, there wasn't a, Vera Randa said, it was like, it was a tiny piano, it was like half a piano. It wasn't loud enough to reach the, the, the back of this epic space. It was unplayable. So, of course, Keith said he wouldn't play it. 
So Vera got on the phone, tried to arrange a replacement, got a piano tuner in, you know, at least we can get it in tune. Um, but it very quickly became apparent there would be no replacement. There was no way to get a proper piano onto the stage. And so all she could do was to, to go out, find Keith Jarrett, who was sitting outside the opera house, in the rain, in his car, and through the window of his car, beg him to play. I'm 17 years old, 1,400 people are showing up in five hours, please play. And so he looked at this rain-drenched teenager, felt sorry for her, and said, never forget, only for you. And so, a few hours later, Keith Jarrett stepped out again onto the Clone Opera House stage, a packed auditorium, 1,400 people. He sat down at the unplayable piano and he began. it became clear that something magical was happening. So Jarrett had decided he was going to avoid these tinny upper registers of the piano. He, he, was, he was going to stick to the middle tones, which gave the work this very soothing, ambient quality. And that might have made it sound a little bit, uh, little bit wallpapery, a little bit too peaceful, a little bit boring. But of course, the other problem that Jarrett had was that the piano was too quiet. So one of his solutions was to set up these rolling, repetitive riffs in the bass to, to try to generate enough resonance to reach the back of the concert hall. And the other thing he did was simply to stand up and to, to twist and to pound down on the piano. You can hear him moaning into the instrument, complaining about it as he plays. But that gives the work this amazing energy. So there's this restfulness and there's this dynamism and the combination of the two is electrifying. And the audience loved it. And audiences continue to love it. I mean, my, two of my children were born to this music. And, and I know they're, they're not the only ones, because this is the most successful solo jazz album in history and the most popular piano album in history. It's a masterpiece. But Keith Jarrett didn't want to play. I mean, yes, he was handed this mess, he embraced it, and he soared, but he had to be guilt-tripped into it. He did not think to himself, hmm, crap piano, this is the perfect opportunity <laughs> to really extend myself creatively. He said, this is a bad instrument, it's going to be a bad concert. He might be wondering, why was it recorded at all? It turned out that Jarrett and Eicher, his producer, they wanted to record this concert. They decided at the last minute they were going to record it because they wanted a documentary record of what a musical catastrophe sounds like. <laughs> so they could play it to future promoters and say, if you don't give us the right piano, this is what you will hear. They never thought it was going to be good. But it was good. It was breathtaking. So that's what I want to talk about. The way that when we're handed these difficult situations, we have to work with tools that break in our hands, or people who annoy us, or, or we have to cope with distractions, all sorts of messy, challenging problems. We actually become better versions of ourselves. These things help us solve problems. They help us be more creative. And yet, like Keith Jarrett, very naturally, we will tend to try to resist. We will reject them. So why, why do I think this is true? Because I've just given you one example. Why do I think it holds more generally? Well, let me give you a few different perspectives. I'll give you some research from cognitive psychology. I'll give you a perspective from computer science. Uh, I will tell you what's going on in social psychology. And of course, I'll talk about rock and roll, because what other way is there to finish a talk at the RSA? So cognitive psychology first. A couple of things. Cognitive psychologists have begun to realize that when you put obstacles in people's way, mo moderate obstacles, they will often overcompensate. You get something better than if there'd been no obstacle at all. 
Lots of different research perspectives on this. Let me just give you one fun example. So uh, Daniel Oppenheimer, psychologist, and a few of his colleagues, uh, a few years ago, teamed up with high school teachers. These are teachers, you know, the chemistry teacher, the English literature teacher, maths teacher, who had multiple classes. And they said, what we want to do is uh, get hold of the handouts that you give to these classes, and we're going to run a randomized trial. So some of the classes will consistently receive handouts formatted in straightforward fonts, such as Arial, Helvetica, Times New Roman. You can judge whether this is the maths class or the English literature class, whatever. Um, we, these are straightforward fonts. The other classes will consistently get handouts that are formatted in something more florid, like monotype Corsiva, or the, so the dense Germanic punch of Hattenschweiler, or the zesty bounce of Comic Sans italicized. <laughs> now, these are ugly fonts, OK? Well, I mean, Hattenschweiler's not ugly. But Hattenschweiler is difficult, and Comic Sans italicized is ugly. These fonts are, are they're hard to read. Okay, you might do a, a wedding invitation in monotype Corsiva. You might do a wedding invitation in Hattenschweiler, although I wouldn't recommend it. But you wouldn't normally write pages and pages of text in these fonts. They are hard to read. And you would think that that was a disadvantage. But it turns out that when these children were given exams at the end of the term, the ones who had been given the fonts, the handouts in the ugly fonts, the difficult fonts, actually did better in all of the subjects. But why is that? Well, we don't know, but here's the theory. If you are given a handout written in Hattenschweiler, it's quite hard to read. And because it's quite hard to read, that's not impossible to read. It's not written in Chinese. It's not formatted in, in wingdings. It's in Hattenschweiler. So you can read it, but it's a bit tricky. You slow down. You slow down, you think, you try to make connections. If there's a word you don't immediately recognize, you try to draw the context from the other words around it. If you get a handout in Times New Roman or Helvetica, you skim over it, you sort of feel like you've already read it, because it's so easy. That seems to be what's going on. So an obstacle put in your way forces you to pay attention, to think about the problem, and so you do better. Keith Jarrett, I am sure, was really paying attention that night. I'm not saying he wasn't always paying attention when, when he performed, but I mean, the adrenaline really must have been running that particular night. Let me give you another example from cognitive psychology. So um, there's a psychologist at Harvard called Shelley Carson. And she has been testing her Harvard undergraduates, who are, of course, the most tested population in the world. Uh, she's been testing them for how good their ability to filter out irrelevant stimuli is. So um, you have strong attentional filters if, for example, you can work on something. There's a TV in the corner of the room. You, you just block out the TV and you work on, work on the text you're, you're, you're looking at. Or you're in a restaurant. You're having a conversation with someone. There's another conversation on the other side of the restaurant. Can you block out that other conversation? If you can, you've got good, strong attentional filters. Now, some people have strong attentional filters and some people have weak filters. What Shelley Carson found was that the Harvard undergraduates with the weak attentional filters was substantially more creative. Now, of course, this is a, a particular sample of the population. These, these people were not in prison. They were not in some kind of remedial school because of their perennial distractibility. They had somehow managed to get to Harvard. So in some way, they were, she had selected from a high-functioning population. But still, interesting, they were more creative. When I say more creative, what do I mean? Well, partly when you give them those funny little laboratory tests and you say, well, how many different uses can you think of for a paperclip? They did better on those tests. But I don't find that very convincing. What I found much more convincing was she said, OK, these are Harvard undergraduates. Some of them, insufferably, have already published their first novel. <laughs> some of them have already produced a play that has received some national review attention. Some of them have received prizes for their art. Some of them have released their first album. So, um, OK, which ones have? Almost always, it was the ones with the poorest attentional filters. The ones whose 
whose attention was constantly being pulled away by something else going on somewhere else in the room. The sights and the sounds of the world were continually battering at their attention uh, and, and calling it away to somewhere else. Now, you would think surely that's a disadvantage, but evidently not. Evidently not. Evidently something about these distractions was providing grist to the creative mill. These people were able to think outside the box because the box was full of holes. So that's a perspective from cognitive psychology, two different perspectives. And really, I have to be clear, we're talking about two different phenomena here. But in both cases, they are things that we would regard as a problem that turn out to actually help us find solutions. So uh, I promised a, a, a perspective from computer science, because you know, I'm a nerd, OK? And psychology, you know, jazz is all a bit kind of, there was magic, and he made a great album, and who knows? So let's, let's talk about computers, OK? Because I feel much more comfortable with that. So there's a whole class of computational problems that are basically unsolvable because uh, we don't have an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of processing power. They just take too long to find a solution. I mean, yeah, if you, if you had you know, multiple universes and, and every, every atom in the universe was a computer, you could grind away, you could find solutions to these problems. Um, they are solvable, but they're just not solvable in a practical time scale. Nevertheless, we need to try to solve them. Um, what kind of problems am I talking about here? Well, the, here's a, uh, a relevant real-world one. How do you lay out the components on an integrated circuit? All kinds of different ways you could lay out the components on an integrated circuit that will all work, but some of them are very inefficient and some of them are highly efficient. It's a packing problem. You know, anybody who's ever tried to have a family holiday will know that the packing problem is a tricky one. And when you're, when you're getting to integrated circuits, you've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of components on an integrated circuit. You're trying to figure out how they all fit together. This is a really hard problem. And you won't find the solution. Okay? All you can do is find a solution that's OK. You can find a reasonably efficient way uh, of packing these components together. And how do you do that? Well, you get a computer itself to help design the computer chip. You get the computer to search. You program an algorithm, uh, some kind of recipe for finding a solution, and you let the algorithm run. So uh, well, what, what kind of algorithm might you use? Well, one you could use is just, oh, just try stuff completely at random. Well, that's no good, because there are so many different possible combinations, and most of them are bad. So a random search, unless you're incredibly lucky, won't give you a good solution. So here's another approach. Let's, it's this very tidy, uh, tidy approach to this problem. Let's go step by step. So we start at a random place. Here is a, um, a circuit. And it works, but it's not efficient. And we're going to take two components, swap it, and rewire so that the logic still works. When we've done that, is the circuit better or worse than the original? If it's better, we keep that change. If it's not better, then we reverse it and we try a different change. And this algorithm is sometimes called the hill climbing algorithm, because it's the idea where you get to the top of Mount Everest one step at a time, continually just looking for uh, where is the place near me that is a bit higher than where I currently am? And in the end, I'll get to the top of Mount Everest. Of course, you won't get to the top of Mount Everest if you happen to be standing at the bottom of a baseball mound. What, you will have to, what you'll do instead is get to the top of the baseball mound, and then you won't be able to get to Mount Everest because there you are, every direction is down. And that's the problem with the hill climbing algorithm. You find solutions, but the solutions, you quickly run out of road. So you disappear down some dead end, it's the, it's the best possible solution nearby, but there may be much, much better ways to lay out these circuits on this computer chip. So what, how do computer scientists solve this problem? Very simple. They add randomness. Lots of different ways to add randomness. Um, there are genetic algorithms that sort of mimic biological processes. There are... Um, uh, annealing algorithms that, that mimic physical processes. There are random restart algorithms that just say, well, do the hill climbing thing for a bit and then try again, and then try again, and then try again. And, and in the end, we'll find something good. But in every case, what you're doing is you've got this systematic search for a solution. It's a very tidy search for a solution, coupled with some randomness. And that's when you actually get to solve these complex problems. And in a way, isn't, isn't that 
also what was happening to Keith Jarrett. Of course, Keith Jarrett is searching for the ultimate musical performance. But he always starts the search in the same place. One man, one piano, let's go. And what this terrible concert planning did to him was to say, Keith, start somewhere else. I'm going to give you a bad piano. You have to avoid these 12 keys and all those keys up there, and you have to hit it much harder. And also, if you do a lot more of this, it sounds much better. Start somewhere new. And if you start somewhere new, you're much more likely to get somewhere new. And if you're good, as Keith Jarrett was, that new place is also going to be a good place. So, OK, computers, Keith Jarrett. Maybe you're thinking, OK, well, what is, what's in this approach for me? So, quick question. Anybody get into London today uh, on the London Underground? OK, a few people. I, I rode my bike, actually, so I'm not going to put my hand up. Um, OK, fine. Uh, so, I'm very sorry for your trouble. And <laughs> you may remember the tube strike a couple of years ago. Two-thirds of London Underground's stations were closed for 48 hours. Now, you could still get to work, or wherever you wanted to go, uh, but you had to use one of the open stations, or alternatively, maybe a bus or an overground train. There were options. But a lot of people had their commutes disrupted. So three economists got hold of the data from the Oyster Card system. All of the regular commuters at the time basically using Oyster Cards so you can track where they're going. And what these researchers did was to identify certain people whose journey was the same every single day. You know, week in, week out, they always make the same journey. And we have a technical term for these people. They are called commuters. <laughs> and the researchers identified these commuters, and then they identified the ones who had had to change their route into work because of the tube strike. So they took some different mode of transport. They caught the bus. They got off at a different station, whatever. And then the researchers said, how many of these people didn't change back after the tube strike? And the answer was tens of thousands. They were a minority, for sure. Most people went back to their old commute. But there were an awful lot of people who didn't. And when you think about it, commuters, if there's, if there's one group of people in the world who surely have their, their route planning absolutely honed to the second, it's commuters. And yet a substantial minority of these people, given this shock, you have to find a new route, found a new route, and it turns out, God, for the last 20 years I've been getting to work the wrong way. <laughs> if only I'd had an earlier tube strike. And I think that's, that's often true. When you're forced to, to try to find some new way to solve a problem, whatever the problem is, um, often the, the new solution isn't going to be better than the old solution. But sometimes it will be. And you only need some good solutions some of the time to, to be really transformative. So that's the perspective from computer science. Okay? That's why this is not just this really weird, mysterious process. You're searching for new starting points, random starting points, because that gets you to new solutions. Now, I said that I would give you a, a view from the world of social psychology. And I find this very difficult, because I'm an economist. You know, social psychology is about people. You know, I prefer numbers. You know, I have a much fuzzier, warmer feeling about numbers than about people. But I, you know, I try. I try. And so what do social psychologists say about this? Well, there's a tremendous amount of research on the impact of having a diverse group of people on decision making. Obviously, there are lots of ethical reasons why you want a diverse group of people, why you want everybody to be represented when you're making decisions. But there are also very practical reasons why you want diversity. There are people from different nations, different races, different ages, different genders, just all these different perspectives in the room. Maybe if you're you know, a rowing team or something and you have to just execute perfectly and be of one mind and never do anything new, then homogeneity can help. But generally, when you're dealing with these fuzzier problems and some degree of creative thinking is needed, a diverse group of people is almost always better than a uniform group of people, even if the uniform group of people are really, really smart. I mean, here we are, Londoners. Imagine 10 Londoners in a room. You would think, well, what could be better than 10 Londoners in a room? And you say, well, you know, we could add somebody from... I don't know, Birmingham, maybe. And you might think, well, no, that can't possibly help. <laughs> but, of course, it can help. Because that person sees something that Londoners don't see. 
The woman sees something the men don't see. The sociologist sees something the mathematicians don't see. You, you, you always get a, a boost to your problem-solving ability when you add diversity. And this has been very, very well explored by lots and lots of different researchers and put together in a lovely book by Scott Page called The Difference, who really, really gets to grips with it. But actually, that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is, is the Keith Jarrett angle on that, by which I mean our resistance to it. So Keith didn't want to play the unplayable piano. We don't want to work in diverse groups. It doesn't matter how, what the research says, we don't want to work in diverse groups. So there's a wonderful study I, I discuss in the book um, called Do People Mix at Mixers? Uh, so it was a kind of a drinks mixer at um, Columbia Business School with a whole bunch of people who said they were going to show up and schmooze and expand their social networks. But they, their name badges all had um, digital trackers in. So you could, they could track exactly who went where in the room throughout this drinks mixer. And basically what happened is people, yes, I'm here to meet new people. Oh, there's Bill. I'll just go and talk to Bill. <laughs> just, just stand in the corner with Bill the whole evening. No, I mean, I, mean, I would... I, that's exactly what I would do as well. I mean, I'm not blaming anybody, but there's this kind of denial. Oh, yeah, we're here to meet new people. They weren't here, there to meet new people. Or at least if they were there to meet new people, they changed their minds immediately they encountered the new people. <laughs> or perhaps even more powerful is a study um, led by Catherine Phillips of Northwestern University. So what Catherine Phillips and her, teams, uh, her team of um, co uh, colleagues did was to ask students to solve murder mysteries. So they're given a dossier of information. There's been a homicide, um, various possible suspects. There are three suspects, witness statements, alibis, photos of the crime scene, here's what the police reckon. All and you read through this, and you have to decide which of these three guys committed the murder. Um, now, it's a hard problem. So one person alone with this information, 20 minutes, the actual success rate is less than 50%. Which is not great, because if you think about it, one chimp alone with this information, the success rate is a third, okay? Because it's multiple choice, there are three people. So, um, so it's quite hard. Get together with a group of three of your friends, and the success rate goes up. It doesn't go up very much. So 20 minutes, four friends working on this problem, the success rate just nudges just over 50%. So what Catherine Phillips did was to say, OK, fine, uh, there's that. Four friends, they're not that great at solving the problem. Here's what we're going to do. Three friends and a stranger. 20 minutes, same information, off you go. One of the things that's interesting about this research is this is not you know, dropping the, the Parisian into the room full of Londoners. This is not dropping the sociologist into the room full of economists. All these people are undergraduates. They all basically have the same perspective, and they all have the same information. Because it's an entirely fictional murder case. So everyone has the same information. The only thing that's different is the social dynamics. Suddenly, we've got to deal with this awkward stranger. And let's face it, there's nothing more awkward than three friends and just this gooseberry standing around. So you will not be surprised to hear, given everything I've been saying, that the three friends and the stranger were better at solving the problem. You might be surprised at how much better. So their success rate went up to 75%. So remember, chimp, 33%. Individual, just under 50. Group of friends, just over 50. Three friends and a stranger, same information, same time limits, 75%. But that's not, even that is not the most interesting thing about this study. The most interesting thing about this study is how people felt about it. So Catherine Phillips interviewed people afterwards and said, how did it go? And the friends were like, oh, it was great. We had a great time. Did you, do you think you caught him? Oh, yeah, for sure. We definitely got him. Completely complacent. Talked to the three friends and the stranger. How was it? Oh, it was kind of awkward. Didn't have a good time. OK, well, you didn't have a good time. Do you think you solved it? No, probably not. I don't think so. It wasn't a good conversation. So it's like Keith Jarrett coming off stage and going, well, that was a disaster. Which, by the way, is pretty much what he did. Even Keith Jarrett didn't think it had been a good concert. It was just the rest of the world disagreed. <laughs> and Catherine Phillips' students came out of their conversations with the stranger and said, well, that really didn't help, completely denying the fact that it had transformed the quality of the conversation. 
And I think this is the challenge we're dealing with. All of these different interruptions, distractions, sources of randomness, unusable tools, awkward strangers, we are in a constant state of resistance to them. We seem that they are messing around with what should be a perfect situation. And we, we refuse to acknowledge that they're actually helping us. Which is why the final perspective I have, I, I, uh, I think, is important. So when I was working on um, this book, uh, I was delighted that Brian Eno agreed to be interviewed. Now, Brian Eno, uh, as you may know, was kind of the weird uh, um, keyboard player in Roxy Music. So he'd sort of come out behind Brian Ferry and kind of play the keyboard with, with big plastic um, knife and fork. Uh, and then he left Roxy Music and he created Another Green World, which some people think is the greatest album ever made. Um, Prince was one of the people who thought it was the greatest album ever made. The drummer on that album, by the way, was Phil Collins. I don't know what happened to him. Um, <laughs> then Brian Eno creates ambient music, a totally new sonic aesthetic. Then, as an encore, he goes on to be a producer or provocateur for all kinds of different acts. So people, brilliant, brilliant artists like the choreographer Twyla Tharp or the minimalist composer Philip Glass, but also huge names in rock and roll, Coldplay, U2, worked on Achtung Baby with U2. And most famously, he worked on three of David Bowie's greatest albums, the Berlin Trilogy, Low, Heroes, and Lodger. And the reason I wanted to talk to Brian Eno is because for Brian Eno, this, this mess, this is a strategy. He's not like Keith Jarrett, who, who was resisting the piano all along. Eno realizes that you have to force people into these situations. And a lot of Eno's thinking echoes what I've been saying over the last uh, 25 minutes or so. So um, he is, by the way, extremely distractible. He says he cannot go to a restaurant where there's music playing because you can't have a conversation because he's listening to the music. Very distractible. He's very interested in this question of attention. The, the idea that when you're put in a threatening situation, suddenly you're very focused, the adrenaline goes, and that's where your creative work comes from. But in particular, he manufactures these messy situations for the musicians he works with. He sees it as his role to be you know, the ugly font or to make them play the unplayable piano. He's the awkward stranger in the room. And the most famous tool he has to impose this on the people he works with is a deck of cards called the Oblique Strategies. The Oblique Strategies are um, just a, this set of really weird gnomic instructions like not building a wall, making a brick, or very quietly in a dark room, or focus on the most embarrassing detail, amplify. There are, there are cards that tell people to swap instruments. Uh, there are, I mean, th these are just insane. And they drove the musicians crazy. So Phil Collins, on Another Green World, was reduced to hurling beer cans across the studio in frustration while he was creating one of the great albums in history. Um, Carlos Alomar, brilliant jazz funk guitarist, fantastic guitarist, just would constantly be telling Eno, this experiment is stupid. And some of the other, so there's one point where Adrian Ballou, another great guitarist, comes into the room. The first thing he says is, why is Carlos on the drums? This is Carlos sitting on the drums, okay? <laughs> They're one of the greatest guitarists in the world. He's on the drums. And then um, Bowie and Eno are like, OK, uh, OK, Adrian, just put the headphones on. Uh, we're going to start the music. Carlos will go one, two, three, and you just play. And Adrian's like, why is Carlos on the drums? Like, don't worry, don't worry about Carlos. Don't worry, it's fine, it's fine. So he's going to go one, two, three. Like, wait, 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 what key is it in? Don't worry about the key, OK? We're going to play the music now. And Adrian Ballou said it was like a freight train coming through his mind. He had no idea what was happening to him or why it was happening. He hadn't heard any of this music before. He didn't even know what key it was in. He had no idea why Carlos was on the drums. He just got a guitar in his hands, and he has to go for it. OK, so when you get back home or to the office, just Google, boys keep swinging. David Bowie is wearing a very nice dress. <laughs> the guitar solo is unbelievable. And it was done by a person in a tremendous amount of stress. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. This is what he would do. He would force this on people. And he knew 
that he had to force it. Initially, the oblique strategies were just a, a, a list of suggestions. Here are things you might want to try, different ways to kind of mess with your thinking. That didn't work at all. Because what would happen is you would go down the list and you just pick whatever was the least disruptive option, whatever would not inconvenience you in any way, that's the one you'd go for, which of course misses the point entirely. It has to be random. It has to be messy. It has to be challenging. And the thing is, years afterwards, these musicians who Brian Eno abused with these cards are finally starting to say, actually, they were pretty good albums. Carlos Alomar said, yeah, those cards, they took me to a new place. And I did not like that place. <laughs> but then, when I came back, I was fresh. So maybe there was something in it. And Carlos Alomar now uses the cards with his own students. He says, I need them to know when they get stuck that they can, they can go to that place and they can feel what I felt. When I told Brownino that, he just laughed. Because he understands. This isn't easy. This isn't something we embrace. We have to be forced into it, however it is, whether it's the draw of a card or whether it's a guilt trip from a German teenager. All of us, from time to time, need to sit down and play the unplayable piano. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. You are now Tim Harford, creative economist. I, I, I love the kind of bridging of the arts and sciences that we've just gone through. Um, I've decided it's now my role to be the ugly font, so my team will be delighted with that. Um, I want to start with that, though. You are synonymous with, with the tidy, you know, with the organising, with the you know, more or less focuses on order, focuses on how do you process information in a clean and fine way. What drew you to looking into this kind of creativity and mess that you've explored here? Well, the, the ability to meet Brian Eno wasn't bad. And I listened to a lot of really good jazz while I was writing the book. So a lot of it was just that there were amazing stories to be told. And I thought that they, f they added up to a larger argument that was exciting to me and felt important. But you mentioned more or less and the statistics, the, the economics. And one of the things that you gain an appreciation of when you are constantly um, statistically smacking people down is that a lot of people put um, a faith in the statistics that, it, that are not, is not justified. So it's not that the statistics are always wrong. We understand our world in really important ways through statistics and um, evidence uh, rigorous trials. I happily stand up for these any day of the week. But very often we get inquiries from people who ask us to look into some, some statistical claim from our, our, from our loyal listeners. And I find myself thinking, well, does it matter whether this claim is true or not? Because actually this claim doesn't tell you anything interesting about the world. You know, the quit rate of teachers or whatever. You know, is it high? Is it low? Is it more or less than we would expect. It's just a, an entirely context-free piece of data. And uh, so one of the motivations, one of many motivations for writing this book was the knowledge that people um, take statistics and then try to use them in all kinds of places where they don't belong. And more generally, I think, we take organizational systems, we take targets, we take PowerPoint slides, uh, which can all be very fine things in their place, and then we try to shoehorn them into a much messier space where they completely backfire. Mm. It's, it's also the kind of looking back and looking forward issue. So actually talking about creativity is talking about innovation and about how we change things, how we bring breakthrough ideas forth. And maybe the, the reflection, the more or less, is, is measuring the status quo. And so there's that. How you yeah, bring so, those two know, things how do, together. How do we think of a new idea and did, was the new idea a good idea? Yeah. There are two separate things, and, and it, it shouldn't be entirely surprising that uh, separate methods are, are used to deal with them. No, exactly. And so, so we're, we're talking in, in this space about the kind of pushing forth the new idea, and the creative process is something that's, that's deeply um, of interest to us here at the RSA. And you described um, Keith Jarrett and Brian Eno's 
experiences in creativity really well. Um, and they weren't a very happy place, you know, that, that how do you push, you know, Keith Jarrett was forced into that and came out feeling like that was the worst experience he'd ever had, and possibly that his output was the worst that it has ever, had ever been. Um, and then, you know, actually you could say Brian Eno liked, was sort of quite enjoying forcing other people through that process. I think Carlos... He, feel, he feels guilty now, by the way. Does he? Yeah. Does he really? He says he feels guilty. He Does says he, he said now he understands how much they disliked it, he would struggle to do that now. Really? That's, that's, that's interesting, the, the power of reflection. Um, I think that the nece necessity of discomfort is something that really comes through here and something that we shy away from. Um, so ha does this creative process always require discomfort? And if so, you know, how do we encourage that we don't, you know, how do we, how do we stop people resisting that? Uh, it, I don't think it always requires discomfort. So I also talk in the book about uh, Miles Davis and the creation of Kind of Blue. And the thing, is not, obviously not news that Kind of Blue was improvised. So I talk a little bit about the process, but what I found really interesting was Miles Davis's reaction to the album, which is one of the greatest albums of the 20th century and changed the course of 20th century music. And afterwards, Davis said, yeah, it wasn't what I was aiming for. And so people say, well, you're crazy. It's kind of blue. It's like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm just saying it wasn't what I was aiming for. So he was very relaxed. He was happy to go into the studio, uh, which, by the way, is a very messy, disused church with lots of, but it doesn't matter. Um, he was happy to go into the studio with a vision of what he wanted to achieve, but loosely enough that when it didn't happen, he wasn't constantly trying to drag it back to his initial vision. He was like, well, this is interesting. Um, and by the way, Bowie, the same way. So Eno says Bowie, almost uniquely in the people he worked with, was able to take an, some accident that had happened, to, to, to be in the middle of something that was nearly perfect, it was nearly finished, and to say, okay, forget that. Something really messy and intriguing just happened, and that's far more important that we chase that than finish the, the perfect thing. Um, but he felt that was unusual. So you, you can do it. Uh, and not only do it, but enjoy it. But I think for a lot of people, it's tricky. Yeah, it's a, it also plays that highly distractible thing where it could be deeply frustrating being with people who are highly distractible. Um, but actually, it comes out with a creative thing. <laughs> Some will be so. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. I mean, just as a side note, Oblique Strategies, I think you said to me earlier, is now an app. There is a Oblique Strategies app. So you can run those cards on your phone. You know, does that dumb it down? Is it still painful if I'm just flipping quickly through? Yeah, you, so Eno says you need just draw one. Okay. Because you draw five and then you're like, oh, I'll pick, them, I'll pick my favourite one. It's draw one and confront that. But you can do that on a phone. So would he find discomfort um, in me saying, no, I'm just going to flip that? I'm going to go, uh, let's do five. Yeah, I think he would probably say that's not the way it's supposed to right. work. But I don't know. You, we'll, we'll, we'll have to ask him. We will. Um, <laughs> but I did find, so I, it's useful to have things, th these things on phones. The cards are quite bulky. I um, was recently on a, on a wonderful uh, American podcast called Planet Money. I've been on there several times talking about economics. And I said, well, I've written this book about, you know, mess. Can I be on talking about that? And they said, we'll find a way. And I thought, how are you going to do that? Because it really is a proper kind of econ podcast. And they got me into the studio. And they said, OK, look, Tim, here's the deal. Nobel Prize this week. It's really boring. It's so technical. But we've got to do it because we're planet money. So you're a creative guru now. What do we do? Um, and they didn't tell me they were going to do this. So the mic's alive. Oh, what are you doing? And I pulled out the, my phone. And I said, OK, I've got the oblique strategies on my phone. Let's draw a card. I had no idea whether this would work. Because it's all very well to say, oh, well, it worked for Bowie and Eno. They had, <laughs> but when someone's actually said, OK, OK, genius. Show now you show, it, you show us. <laughs> It was brilliant. It was a transformational experience, pulling these, these um, apps out. We did record several, but we sort of did one at a time, looked at it, thought you'd brainstorm some ideas, and then we said, OK, let's do another one. And, and uh, so we, I think we did justice to them. But the energy in the room, suddenly, they were full of ideas as to how to treat it. I must say, I haven't heard the final <laughs> podcast yet. <laughs> so we will see. I'm listening out for it with some trepidation. but. It, in that moment, it felt very helpful. Mm, no, it's, it's, I think it's, it's very interesting because you talk about um, randomness and some of these human discomforts of kind of what it is to be in conversation with people. But in your book, 
you talk about diversity not just as you know mixers and how we communicate with each other but actually thinking about random ways of um, using mess to create resilience um, and some of that actually is about really getting getting dirty getting going towards our disgust reflex in some of the, the d experiments you talk about. Are you about to talk about poo transplants? Well, I was going to not call it that, <laughs> okay, um, but there was something ab about faecal bacteria. Yes. Yeah, there are several things about faecal yes. bacteria. So, yeah, there is, this, there, there is this very interesting line of research now, some of which is very far out, some of which is much better established. Um, Realising that a lot of the, the bugs inside us live, live in our guts, live under our nails, live on our skin, uh, live in our environment, uh, actually doing us a lot of good. And that we need to be <coughs> careful about the way we use antibiotics, not just because of microbial resistance, but because we might actually be killing the good bacteria. Now, I, should, I recommend, by the way, Ed Yong's book, I Contain Multitudes, uh, on this topic. It's great. There's just a little bit in Messy about it. And I think there's a lot of um, you know, bad science going on around the subject, but it's a reminder that when we try to, to tidy up a system, a biological system, too much, it can become very fragile. And there are other examples in the book. Um, for example, the, the German project to create scientific forests, uh, where every tree is the same breed, every tree is the same size. We clear all the snags away. We clear all the undergrowth away. Temporarily brilliant, transformational. The, the crop yields absolutely skyrocketed. Um, and German scientific forestry pronounced victory, and then all the trees started to die, because it turns out the system's extremely fragile. Mm. No. So a creative application in science is, is important as well. Yeah. Than, well, it's, the, it's, it's not just about... The, the book is partly about creativity, and I've talked about creativity and problem-solving uh, today, but it is also, as I think the subtitle says, it's, about, it's also about resilience. So systems... Um, that are too tidy, that are too optimised for one particular use, the moment the wind changes, you have a problem. And we see this, I talk about it in terms of banking regulation, for example, and emissions regulation. Um, it's not just about cool, creative new things, it's also about messier systems often being more resilient than very uh, optimised, tidy systems. Absolutely. So I'm going to go out to the floor, if you'd like to raise your hand. Gentleman in the front here. Uh, gentleman in the middle, got any ladies to add to the mix, otherwise it's going to be a lady in the front too, so. Yeah, hello there. Uh, my name's Jonathan Kyle, I'm a fellow. Um, I was just interested in that, is essentially what you're talking about is people thinking? Because the, the messiness seems to me to be actually providing a, a platform for getting rid of the default situation of thinking and therefore people relying more on their innate cognitive abilities. So in a way, starting from scratch. I mean, I'm reminded apparently Jung said that some of his best work was done um, when there were dreams which he hadn't come across before, because he said they're satisfying because it's difficult, but then I do my best work. And I just wondered whether you think it's more actually to do with people thinking at the end of the day. Sure. Do you want to take several questions, or shall I just start? No, we'll start with that question. Yeah, yeah I think that is, it is partly just about you're fixed on a particular way of thinking, and some kind of shock can put you somewhere new, and maybe that's a blank slate, or, may, but, or maybe it's just a new challenge. So it is partly that. It's not, in, it's not, not completely that. I, I also discuss um, the importance of task rotation. So multitasking, obviously, bad, but multiple projects and moving from one project to another and back again is something that almost every creative uh, artist and scientist has, has done. Um, and that is partly about just allowing some mental rest. It's partly ab about allowing subconscious processing of, of ideas while you're working on something else. And it's partly that these ideas cross-fertilize each other. Gentleman in front. Uh, so Thomas Ashar, also a fellow here. Um, yeah, it sounded, uh, what came to mind was the thinking fast and slow from a few years ago and sort of single and double loop thinking. So it's like, how do you push people out of just normal, normal thinking modes to be pressured? Um, and I liked your forest uh, example because what I was thinking during your talk is that it sounded like there are a lot of situations where you put people in an uncomfortable scenario and a nice result comes out. 
Whereas, and I work in the development sector, and the whole debate in the development sector is like, how do you think more about adaptive programming, especially for long-term complex scenarios? And that's where you can't, like the forest scenario is like, oh, it looks like there was a good result in the short term, but it turned out to be a bad one. So it's like, does this, could you speak, or do you have any thoughts about how this applies within a sort of complex system, as it's called, as in something where you're not really sure of what the result is that you want to get, but you want to think a bit more creatively about it, but you're not quite sure where you're going. Yeah, I mean, my, my previous book, Adapt, probably has more to say about, particularly about development. Um, but I think that the, the relevant part of, of this book is our tendency to treat facts on paper or facts on a computer screen, which are very easy to process. Uh, we feel facile when we see them. We feel like we've, we've understood the situation. Those facts are actually not necessarily very good representations of what's going on on the ground, which is much more complex and messy and, and harder to write down. And the, the deepest thinker about this problem is, is James Scott, with his, his famous book, Seeing Like a State, and also uh, Two Cheers for, for Anarchism, both of which I riff off um, in the book. But there, yeah, it's part, it, I think one of the issues we have a lot in the modern world is um, that because the data we're getting the map, the spreadsheet, uh, the corporate report, because that data is easy to process, um, we kind of stop at that and say, well, that's fine, that's enough. It's, of course, very helpful. You cannot visit everywhere in the world. You cannot conduct in-depth interviews with every villager in sub-Saharan Africa. So you need to rely on statistics in part, but, but that's not the only thing. The lady in the front. Did you come across the work with um, art teachers who get people to use their left hand when they're right-handed to draw, um, if they're copying a portrait to turn the head upside down, then you get a much better drawing. I mean, it's to do with the way the brain works. You have an idea of the head. And the other one thing I was going to ask you is about the educational system, which divides up the different disciplines. And when at school, you know, you're either doing your arts or your sciences, and you don't mix. I was lucky that I could, but that was because it was a very enlightened school. And universities are told to um, make sure that they're designed so that the different disciplines all bump into each other and, and kind of over social situations are actually in the same building. But as we know, different faculties are in completely different buildings. So have you looked at whether they're designing buildings to take into account the fact that you need to meet other people, strangers, or people who are not from the same academic background? Sure, thank you. Uh, so I, I'm, I am aware of the, the, the right hand, left hand, upside down uh, drawing. There. I think it's, it's interesting and it's relevant. Um, there's another study I describe in the book uh, where people were asked to draw pictures of animals and then halfway through you'd be drawing a cat or something and then the, the psychologist would say, oh no, it has to be an animal that lives underwater. Um, and, and what they found was when people were suitably primed to, to work with their mistakes, you had to kind of give them a pep talk beforehand. Uh, when people were suitably primed, they then produced much better work when they were handed these, well, it's as half a cat, and now it has to be some kind of sea cat. Or another one, they were asked to um, first describe their breakfast, and then to write an essay about morning. Um, and, of course, morning, ha you could be talking about grief, because um, you're just asked to write an essay about morning. And what would happen, but because people were thinking about breakfast, they'd start writing an essay about their morning routine. And, um, and then halfway through, the, the psychologist would come in and say, oh, no, no morning, like you know, funerals and loss. <laughs> anyway, keep going and see, see how it goes. And again, people just produce much better results. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's definitely something very interesting going on here. In terms of interdisciplinary work, this is actually where the book started. Um, although there's not that much of it in the book, and the book you should read if you're really interested in this is Gillian Tett's book, The Silo Effect, um, which is very good, uh, specifically on this. But we do have these buildings as, that you describe. They're called Oxford and Cambridge Colleges. And, I, and I'm not sure they work as well these days. 
because you, you need to give people, it's not just enough to give people physical proximity so they might bump into each other. You need to give them a reason to work together. There's a study I describe at some length in the book that um, I think is not well known enough, uh, the, the Robbers Cave study by uh, Muzaffar Sharif, conducted in the 1950s, where effectively some psychologists created uh, a war between two groups of boys. They were away at summer camp, having a great time, and they suddenly became aware there was another group of boys at the summer camp. And just a little bit of prodding, a little bit of competition, and so these, these boys were going at each other with, with rocks in the bottom of socks. I mean, it was really... It was, wasn't pretty. And then the psychologists set themselves to the task of how do we get these boys to work together again? And the solution that you described that we often hear, oh, proximity, doesn't work at all. So they'd... they'd watch films together, they'd eat together, that would just mean food fights. Um, it, didn't, it didn't work, they actually needed a joint project. And I don't, I don't want to spoil the story, but it kind of brought a tear to my eye, what happened in the end. They, there is a way to get warring tribes of 11-year-old boys to make peace, but it involves a shared project. And talking to the Oxford Martin School, which is an interdisciplinary center, it's not about the physical location so much as giving people a reason to work together because there are so many natural barriers to working with people we don't know, people who think differently to us. The resistance is very strong. Simply putting you over dinner together won't do it. But giving you a shared challenge where you need each other, that can break down the barriers. Proximity can often spark rivalry, in fact. You get your kind of biggest, biggest rivalry in, in the derbies, the London derbies, and the people who are right next door. Um, we shan't talk about teams. Uh, gentleman over there, and I think we have a microphone here too, and the lady there. So. Oh. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my name is Kevin Spellman, and I'm also a fellow. Um, when we talk about complexity, things that change over time, where the components aren't aware of each other, so on and so forth, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts as far as economies. So, in creativity and complexity, you're not quite sure what's going to happen at the end, as someone else also noted. But in terms of economy, there is uh, an accountability. Did this produce what it is that we needed? And what do you think will enable us, for me as a creative person, going into these scenarios saying, who knows what we'll have at the end? But you know what? Let's just take a chance. Because failure or perceived failure in that instance often isn't reflected upon years ahead when they realize Actually, that was a brilliant idea. I think it's a very insightful question. I think that um, the, the economy is actually built on uh, uh, generations and generations of dumb ideas that fail and the occasional good idea that spreads. And this is a perspective I took in a previous book, Adapt. We just described this 100-year history throughout the 20th century of one big corporation after another coming up with a brilliant idea and then going bankrupt. But the idea lives on. Um, so I think economic systems, when they work well, they allow that experimentation. And they're, they're quite messy, they're quite uncontrolled, um, but good stuff happens. Um, it's often quite a mysterious way in which good stuff happens, but, but, but it does. Um, but you need, I think, a real diversity of economic models and of economic spaces. So the, the thinker I keep coming back to on this again and again and again is Jane Jacobs, um, author of The Death and Life of Great American Cities and many other works. And the, uh, one of the many profound observations that Jacobs makes is that if you want a city economy to work well, it needs a diversity of different kinds of building. That seems like well, that's a very mundane sort of observation. But that's because some sorts of activity have a very predictable economic return and can pay high rents. Other sorts of activity are much more speculative. They might produce something brilliant. They might not. They need in some way to be propped up. And there are all kinds of different subsidies and so on you could use, but the most straightforward way of propping up uh, low rent activities is low rent. So big, cheap spaces. Something London is struggling with now. Um, so I think that actually um, a healthy economy does a lot of what you're describing. Um, and and, we, and we, co we constantly need to be looking for the low rent spaces, for the, for the areas where there, there is a, there's space to fail and experiment. 
Um, because if everything has to deliver a return very quickly, I think you get an economy that's extremely sterile and fragile. Completely. Lady there and then gentleman there. Um, listening to you speak um, brings to mind um, Adam Curtis's film Hypernormalization. I'm not sure if you've seen it yet. Um, one of the points he makes is, is that the current geopolitical situation is terribly, terribly complex, too complex for any of us to understand. And politicians have used that by making things very simple, very clean, very black and white, and selling us this story of what reality really is, what he calls hypernormalization. So my question to you is, how would you apply the oblique strategies to geopolitics? Oh, there's a big one. <laughs> and we are slightly out of time, so... Um... <laughs> I, I think the British people just voted to give themselves an almighty shock and we will see whether we are able to conjure some magic out of this particular unplayable piano or not. That's a beautiful place to end. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all the questions but we are um, on time. So Tim will be available outside. Um, I, I understand he has a beautiful signature to um, apply to his book should you choose to procure one. But um, please join me in thanking Tim Harford. <laughs>